Hi, I'm AJ Kluth, and thanks for being here today for my talk, Decolonizing Ontological and Epistemological Assumptions of Institutional Music Study. I don't remember when I first became aware of the idea of conceptual imperialism, but I do remember at a relatively young age, I was knocked out by Friedrich Nietzsche's 1873 essay on truth and lies in an extra moral sense. The essay wrestles with the relationship between truth and concepts, and he reminds the reader that many ideas taken to be true are in fact based upon assumptions that the cultural imaginary has forgotten to be assumptions. Truths, he says, are illusions about which one has forgotten that this is what they are, metaphors which are worn out and without sensuous power, coins which have lost their pictures and now matter only as metal, no longer as coins. Such normalization of a dominant concept as truth, he warns, might lead to erasure of that concept's history and its animating assumptions, many of which are furthermore related to greater histories of socially constructed fields of power and their justification. Now, name-checking Nietzsche is a funny way to start a talk on decolonization. Still, I offer this as a kind of personal conceptual genealogy. Of course, the observation that knowledge is historical and constructed, culturally contingent and constitutive of power has been a central theme of deconstruction and feminist thought. However, my talk today starts from, a, uh, from premises that are a little older mostly German transcendental idealism. To get to decolonization, I will rehearse some histories from excellent scholarship, excuse me, and demonstrate how several concepts in the history of Western art music have been normalized to the point of erasure of their historical provenance and in the process bear assumption as truths. I'm interested in the ways in which these concepts are implicated in the construction and reproduction of the canon that has become an historical cycle of investiture of capital, be it economic, symbolic, or cultural. The resulting academic and social values have implicated institutional spaces of music study in processes of class stratification, gatekeeping, and the ongoing justification of inequitable hierarchical structures. It is easy to see that the supposed objectivity and universality of these phenomena have shrouded imperialist capitalist white supremacist patriarchy in terms of supposedly objective musical formalism. Important as all this is, it's old news. So after having discussed a few of these ideas in an admittedly nonlinear and incomplete fashion, I will consider how they're relevant to recent moves related to the decolonization of music study in theory and practice. But first, about decolonization. Calling anything associated with social justice decolonization diminishes the demands of decolonization. These include things like reparative justice in material and political terms, such as land back and indigenous sovereignty, but nonetheless, I believe that the term is legitimately deployed here as a means by which to discuss the conceptual imperialism that has historically justified and supported genocide, dispossession, and white supremacy around the world. Though not initially material orient, materially oriented, our ends in recognizing these historically invisibilized issues are politically and teleologically in step with material work to be done. So then my paper deploys decolonization as a metaphor but nonetheless one used to illustrate how our critical engagements with imperialist histories can foment recognition of the ways and means by which our tools for understanding the world have been colonized by dominating modes of thought. The development of this critical consciousness is important, but certainly not the end of the story. If such cultivation is taken to be an end in itself, we too are liable to believe that such conversations are enough, stumbling into bad faith ideas that we did it, mission accomplished. In their foundational essay, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor, Eve Tuck and Kei Wen Yang remind us that the pursuit of social justice through a critical enlightenment can also be a settler move to innocence, diversions, distractions, which relieve the settler of feelings of guilt or responsibility and conceal the need to give up land or power or privilege. That is not my intention. Rather, I hope to encourage the divestment from privilege and refiguration of music study writ large. It might hurt, but nothing changes if nothing changes. I hope to point past simply locating historical assumptions and erasures that have propped up hierarchical systems of judgment and value production, all in an effort to consider how we might reimagine the role of music study and create new normals that decenter white supremacy and create spaces for music study that reflects the diversity of our communities. And beyond that, to ask how that might further interleave with justice-oriented praxis in our respective communities. Demonstrating how knowledge and culture were as much part of imperialism as raw materials and military strength, Linda Tuhuai Smith suggests systems of knowledge and regimes of truth were mobilized to justify the superior, superiority of European imperialists with the necessary. Excuse me, let me try again. Um, Smith suggests that systems of knowledge and regimes of truth were mobilized to justify the superiority of European imperialists and the necessity of the modernist project. 
Leaving no phenomenon unscienced, we see the birth of Musikwissenschaft, or music science, in the 19th century in Germany, replete with attendant epistemological assumptions about music and its proper modes of study. Linda Gare has demonstrated how Vertreue, or the work concept in Germany, concretized music as an object that was fixed and autonomous of the imminent. The fidelity of performance necessitated by this concept of music tied it to inscription as well as the cult of personality related to the notion of composer and later the conductor as genius. And in spite of the development of art music's 19th century claims to aesthetic autonomy via a radical distance from historical and cultural contingency, the concept sometimes also supported claims of ethnic, racial, and nationalist superiority. And furthermore, the work's exemplarity relied on the genius of the composer who, as Edward Hanslick suggested in the mid-19th century, embodied the sensitivity to receive the germ of a suitable theme that would then be skillfully developed. The exact means by which this occurred were mysterious, but to those theorists and critics invested in the idea, they were self-evident. Following Immanuel Kant regarding the primacy of organicism and formal unity and non purposive beauty, each exemplar work was assumed to comprise a synthetic formal whole whose parts related to one another logically and necessarily like a house of cards. The epistemological and ontological assumptions that valorized disembodied reason and formal analysis of an inscribed, bound, repeatable object were concretized in academia and the popular imagination. As by lucky divine accident, very best examples of good music happened to be German. Like all arts in 19th century Germany, music became implicated in the cult of Bildung, or self-cultivation. This ideology related art with the divine in a post-enlightenment world. The privileged and educated bourgeoisie class adopted the attitude that access to art education partially justified the differentiation of classes. A kind of aristocratic romantic art religion developed that valorized artworks, be they music, sculpture, painting, etc., as aesthetically autonomous phenomena that, according to their degree of beauty, transcended the imminent. Following George William Friedrich Hegel, Reinhard Koselik notes that it is the task of precisely Bildung to perceive and alleviate alienation in order to mediate reality and self-awareness. How much reality and power an individual gets thus depends on his Bildung. To some degree, then, Kant's and Hegel's aesthetic theories have become implicated in the validation of social stratification. The canonization of artworks of all kinds and the rationalization of privileged arts institutionalization. Moreover, socially normalized understandings of the metaphysical dignity of great music charged uh, burgeoning musicology in the German Academy with an often tautological importance. The canon of great works identified in the 19th century was, in effect, great for being great by the terms it had in its critical and social context, simultaneously invented and apotheosized. Furthermore, beauty was cast as non-conceptual, disinterested, self-referential, and ultimately divorced from knowledge or understanding in the world. Though the library of extant musical works is in fact heterogeneous and inconsistent, idealized musical structures were identified and formalized. Music science's formalist, atomistic strategies also characterized their criteria as objective and universal, thereby supposedly freeing it from prefer preferential issues of race, ethnicity, or xenophobia and its pronouncements. And so then, in both the cultural imagination through the primacy of the canon and its supporting logic, as well as institutionally through the formalization of exemplar structures and means of analysis, these assumptions proliferated. In Europe and around the world in imperialized, colonized locales, it was to be understood that the great European works of art music were defensively superior to the music of the, quote, other, as well as any music with use or function such as dancing, relaxation, or religious connotation. The supremacy of European music, that most associated with the legitimacy of the claims of imperial powers and their holdings around the world, became dominant. The conflation of art music, transcendent spiritual truth, and economic capital has created the familiar contours of the canon, institutions of musical training, and the raced class structures it reproduces. Previous to the new musicology, the focus on collection and formal analysis swelled library shelves with official histories, or text editions of scores, and analyses that justify their exemplarity. This eventually extended to serialism and other formal outgrowths of, quote, serious music, but so-called vernacular musics continued to be relegated to ethnomusicological pursuits interested in the social functions of music. Of course, the interventions of the new musicology have created an incredible variety of analyses of any and all kinds of music, effectively deconstructing the master narrative of absolute music and extensively demonstrating how music is bound up in the world. 
Lawrence Kramer went so far as to announce in 1995 that the autonomous artwork and ostensibly all of its cultural, metaphysical, and theoretical implications is as dead as Elvis. As an ac academic consensus, that's great, it really is. Uh, new forms of criticism do much to expand our horizons and cultivate critical consciousness. However, they exist safely within the gate-kept walls of institutional discourse and seem not to foment much in terms of effective praxis to undo the historical division done in the name of imperialist, capitalist, white supremacist patriarchy, the philosophical assumptions of music study formally justified. Okay, so now we're finally getting to a discussion of something approaching moves toward decolonization in music study. In the last two years, calls to address the whiteness and privilege of some areas of music study have become louder and more effective. For example, Danielle Brown's 2020 open letter on racism in music study ultimately led to a vote of no confidence by the board of directors of uh, the then president of the uh, Society for Ethnomusicology. In the same summer, the Journal of Shankarian Studies published its volume 12 that included criticisms of Philip Ewell's ideas that describe what he refers to as music theory's white racial frame. This here pictured as volume 11 because volume 12 is no longer uh, hosted on their website. Um, the Shankergate summer that followed has brought this hyper-specialized corner of music study to the public eye, inviting reactionary talk of cancel culture um, and appeals to diversify and better represent popular musics in institutional environments such as Lauren Kajikawa's The Possessive Investment in Classical Music, Confronting Legacies of White Supremacy in U.S. Schools and Departments of Music, are making the rounds, and special volumes of musical, uh, excuse, music pedagogy journals are reimagining what curricula could be. Still, we have witnessed that the contemporary university is able to withstand and absorb criticism of its hierarchical structures as part of those very structures. For example, the works of thinkers such as Herbert Marcuse that informed the student revolts in the late 1960s are still powerful, but rarely inspire student revolt. And Foucault, too, whose analyses of regimes of knowledge and power are widely read, rarely cause revolt or restructuring within those institutional spaces it addresses. Mark Fisher describes the blunting of the bite of criticism as performative engagement, radical ideas being paraded about with corked teeth. He says, what we're dealing with now is not the incorporation of materials that previously seemed to possess subversive potentials, but instead their pre-incorporation. The preemptive formatting and shaping of desires, aspirations, and hopes by capitalist culture. Witness, for instance, the establishment of settled alternative or independent cultural zones, which endlessly repeat older gestures of rebellion and contestation, as if for the first time. Alternative and independent don't designate something outside mainstream culture, rather they are styles, and in fact, the dominant styles within the mainstream. Mapped onto musicological discourse, we might read this as the methodological revolutions of the new musicology being absorbed by institutional logic. Going forward, I wonder, can our continued critical engagements with music, especially those rooted in anti-capitalist methods, be made in good faith from within the neoliberal university structure, or will they too be absorbed into those very mainstream institutions? So this is where I get a bit stuck. At least in a discursive space, I find that I'm often bound up in these historically dominant ideas about musical objects, still engaging with those philosophical and analytic assumptions noted above either directly or in the negative by still having to respond to them. I'm inspired by those thinkers in feminist studies, queer theory, black studies, and related discourses that for me model productive ways to think historically about how our regimes of thought have produced the present while offering means by which to look beyond them. Thinkers such as Fred Moten, Sarah Ahmed, Robin D.G. Kelly, Catherine McKittrick, Bell Hooks, George Lewis, and Ruth Wilson Gilmore model this kind of scholarship. And still, if my ostensive teleology for this project is to flow into a larger stream of decolonizing praxis, I seem to have a long way to go. In his book, A Third University is Possible, La Paperson, who is an avatar of Kei Wen Yang, suggests that extant university values and structures might be mobilized to incrementally subvert institutional logic through the slow divestment from colonizer logic and investment in indigenous logic. The idea he presents is not to dissolve the university, but to plug the university into decolonizing assemblages. In this formulation, the first world university accumulates through dispossession. The second world university, which is the one we presently inhabit, liberates through liberalism. The third world university breaks faith from its own machinery by inspiriting the academic automaton with a fourth world soul. Fourth world soul here refers to indigenous cosmology, wisdom, and sovereignty that is usually dominated by colonizing powers. From this approach, rather than accumulating or critiquing, the third university slowly strategizes a refiguring of power structures from within. 
going beyond simple pluralism that offers a space at the table of power for presumed others, this might work to divest from historical conceptual imperialism to change the very shape of the table. So I offer two examples of institutions whose music departments are doing just this in different ways. Uh, perhaps most visibly has been Harvard's development of the Creative Practice and Critical Inquiry doctoral program in the Department of Music headed by Vijay Ayer. By bringing practitioner scholars of experimental and non-Western musics together, Harvard is modeling radical changes in what is appropriate to teach and to study. Furthermore, music concentrators or majors have huge access to a variety of training well beyond traditional music education, even divesting from Western history and theory requirements. Even more specifically oriented to my discussion of philosophical assumptions is UCLA's practice-based experimental epistemology research lab or peer lab headed by Nina Eidsheim. The lab's website notes, at the UCLA peer lab, we study the creative process involved in everyday traditional and emerging practices. We pay attention to how oppressed groups and individuals survive, pursue knowledge, and express joy through music and sound. And acknowledge, excuse me, and acknowledging storytelling is the root of cultural appropriation. We take an active part in which stories are, are told and who gets to tell them. Though housed at UCLA, anyone can become an affiliate researcher of the peer lab. Music in this space is considered as a multimodal imminent phenomenon situated in the body as much as cultural discourse, and all modes of knowledge are equally respected. Both of these examples are housed at elite institutions that through their sheer size are able to decenter the primacy of quote traditional inquiries into music. Is it possible to engage with similar moves in smaller, less well-funded academic institutions? All right, it's clear that our modes of thinking condition what we believe to be possible, informing our actions. In our contemporary hyperconnected plurality, each of us bring different musics and modes of musicking to a stand in our local and globalized communities. By learning to think expansively about what music is and does, we create the conditions to be and act differently and potentially more justly. Addressing the need to respond to the ever-changing reality of music as a complex expression of cultural identities, George Lewis points beyond pluralism in the situation of a Creole. He locates in the fungibility of new musical forms a mode of creolization that annihilates previous appeals to universalities, monolingualism, and purity. He calls for new musics and modes of thinking that exceed the limiting logics of remixing and postmodern pastiche, or even mollifying institutional pluralism. Rather than only making space for others, such a creolization would delexicalize the foreign as other. Elizabeth Gould develops Donna Haraway's idea of companionable species to a similar end, one that rejects the discourse of inclusion of the other that often works to reinscribe dominant power structures. Rather, if we relinquish our collective obsession with pervasive discourse of inclusion that relies on bringing, quote, others to the profession as it currently exists to the extant conversation table, we might instead work to create spaces in which to co-create together a contingent dynamic table of potentialities. The previous dominance of a work-oriented ontology associated with metaphysical dignity and spiritual transcendence supported by specialized knowledge tautologically developed by institutional music study was clearly a partner in the justification of imperialist, capitalist, white supremacist, uh, white supremacist patriarchy. Such modes of conceptual imperialism have been problematized for years, albeit with much of their radicality absorbed by the logic of the neoliberal university. Still, the old dominant narrative of Western art music continues to hold sway in the cultural imaginary and the logics evaluation that prop up the institutional status quo. It is my hope that in keeping these histories present to mind, we might be brave enough to continue refuting the privilege of specialized knowledge in favor of a democratization of ways of knowing and being with music, even if that means to uh, actively divest from accustomed privilege. Doing so, I hope we can slowly move the decolonization of music study from the space of metaphor to the space of material praxis. Thank you.